This is going to be an overview of the book of Numbers. And this book is one of the least read books in the Bible. Because people just think it's boring and dull. However, I'm going to show you that this book is like an action and adventure movie. A lot of amazing things happen in this book. And someone said that the book of Numbers is the scariest book in the Bible because it shows how great God is at keeping record of things. So God knows everything you've done since you've been saved. He knows everything every lost man has done, and he's keeping record of what they've done. When the last man is judged, he's judged according to his works. And Matthew twelve thirty six says, But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof at the day of judgment. So remember that God knows and hears and sees everything that you're doing and he's keeping record and keep that in mind when you read the book of numbers how good the lord is at keeping record so first off let's see why this book is called the book of numbers and if you look at numbers chapter 1 and verse 3 it says from 20 years old and upward all that are able to go forth to war in israel thou and aaron shall number them by their armies so this is why it's called the book of Numbers, because the Lord has them to take a census of the armies of Israel in the wilderness. And through this book, you can look at it and get practical truth for the Christian, even today, when it comes to spiritual warfare. And you know about spiritual warfare? It says in Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 11, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So, not only can you get some truth concerning warfare for the saint, you can also get some good meaty doctrine from the pictures of the Lord Jesus Christ in this book. The Bible is a picture book. It has better pictures than a book of just illustrations. And the Bible doesn't have pictures like that it like it's illustrated but it's got pictures from one end to the other so let's get into it in chapter one you have a census of israel's warriors and this ought to remind you that you aren't alone as a soldier in the lord's army there's other people in this army with you many times you think you're the only bible believer left but the lord has one one more somewhere else and then he's got another one over here and another one over there. You're just scattered around everywhere. And one of the strangest stories in the book of Numbers has to do with a woman and her husband. And this has to do with the husband's jealousy. If a man suspected his wife of committing adultery, he can bring her before the priest. The priest takes holy water in an earthen vessel and adds to the water dust that is in the floor of the tabernacle. And this is like a lie detector test that the Lord gives to Israel. If she drinks the water and she's guilty of committing adultery, then it will cause her belly to swell and her thigh to rot. And this should remind you how that the church is married to Jesus Christ. This should remind you of Exodus 20 and verse 5, which says, I, the Lord, am a jealous God. Jealousy isn't a bad thing. This is has to do with a husband's jealousy. If a husband was jealous, if he thought that his wife had been cheating on him, he could take her to the priest and have this done. And 
the Lord gets jealous over us even today in 2 Corinthians 11, 2. It says, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So God is a jealous God and doesn't want to share you with the world. Picture that water the woman drinks as the word of God. If you take the word of God, then it will reveal to you if you are living right or if you're shacking up with the world. The Bible is what makes sin appear exceeding sinful. It will reveal to you the bad things in your life. Just like that water that woman drank revealed if she had actually committed adultery or if she didn't. And then a few chapters later in chapter 12, you have Moses get a new wife. She's an Ethiopian. He probably went over to Aaron, his brother, and married him and said, well, guess who's coming home for dinner? He said, I'm, I'm married in Ethiopian, and she's coming over. And Aaron and Miriam didn't like that Moses got with this woman. And it says in Numbers 12, 1, And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman who he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. So there you have the plot for several movies, a relationship between a man and a woman that people don't think should be together. But since Miriam spoke against Moses, she ended up getting leprosy. In Numbers 12, 9 through 10, it says, The anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle, and behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow, and Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. So just like Moses took a wife that didn't think he should, the Ethiopian wife, the Lord Jesus Christ, takes a Gentile bride, which is us. And in chapter 13, Israel sends some spies over to spy out the land of Canaan. In Numbers 13, 2, it says, Send thou men, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. Every tri Of every tribe of their fathers shall you send a man, every one a ruler among them. They go over there to spy out the land, and the Lord wants them to go over to get a battle plan. However, it turns out they go over to spy out the land to see if they should go into it or not. When they're just supposed to go into it, it's not about should they go into it or not. But they get over there and they see giants. They have uh, all kinds of scary things over there that scared them, scared the spies, and they brought back an evil report. And there you have a plot for many movies because they get over there and they see giants. In Numbers thirteen seventeen, it says, And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, and said unto them, Get you up this way southward, and go up into the mountain, and see the land, what it is, and the people that dwelleth therein, whether they be strong or weak, few or many, and what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad, and what cities they be that they dwell in, whether in tents or in strongholds, and what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, whether there be wood therein or not, and you be of good be ye of good courage, and bring of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. So they went up and searched the land from the wilderness of Zin unto Rehob, as men come to Hamath. Now Numbers thirteen twenty three says, And they came into the brook of Eskel, and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes, and they bear it between two upon a staff, and they brought of the pomegranates and of the figs. So uh, the, the fruit of the land was so great that they're having to bear it upon a staff. And then in Numbers 13, 25, And they returned from searching of the land after forty days. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told them and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there, the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are 
well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. So you see these uh, guys, other than Caleb here, are scared to go fight these people. So God didn't have them go over to decide whether they would go over or not. But that's what they ended up doing. They were so scared, even though the Lord was with them, they were intimidated by the devil's crowd, just like many Christians today get intimidated by the devil's crowd. But they forget Romans 8.31, which says, What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? But in Numbers 14, you have to be brave warriors for the Lord, just like Joshua and Caleb. If you're looking for a, an example to follow, follow these two courageous warriors here in Numbers 14. It says, And Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that surround, searched the land, rent their clothes, and they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. But Israel won't listen. Now they will have to wander forty years in the wilderness for their disobedience, because in forty years the rebellious generation will all be dead. And the new generation will go in to possess the land. And then in number 16, you have something happen that you would only find in some type of action movie. You have Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, who also end up going against Moses. So the Lord does something about it. Here in number 16, verse 29, it says, And if these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open her mouth and swallow them up with all that appertain unto them, and they go down quick into the pit, then you shall understand that these men have revoked the Lord. And it came to pass, as he had made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up in their houses, and all the men that appertain unto Korah and all their goods, they and all that appertain to them, went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. So this was the first recorded journey to the center of the earth, way before the movie ever came out. These guys went down alive into the pit. Imagine falling into hell alive. And after so many chapters showing how man is nothing more than a failure, the Lord gives us some types of Jesus Christ who will die for the sin of mankind. He will die for us failures. So you have all these chapters just showing how bad man is. And then in this next chapter, you have types of the Lord Jesus Christ. In number 17, you have Aaron's rod that budded. Now, the rod was a dead tree that's been carved into a rod. So the rod is laid up overnight and then is alive again. Just like the Lord is he that liveth and was dead, and behold, he is alive forevermore. He laid overnight for three days and three nights and rose again. Just like Aaron's rod that budded blossomed and yielded almonds after it was just a dead tree. So Moses brought all the rods and showed them to the children of Israel, just like the Lord was shown before many witnesses after his resurrection. Aaron's broad budding proves that he was the one chosen of God to be high priest, just like the Lord was already chosen, but his resurrection confirmed it. And then you have a great picture of the Lord Jesus Christ in Numbers chapter 20. Israel needed water. 
They're out of Egypt, which is the top of the world, and only one thing can quench their thirst, and that is something given supernaturally from God. And God is going to supernaturally give them water. Just like after you get saved, the Lord supernaturally gives you something from this book. But before you look there, you need to read Exodus 17.6. And in Exodus 17, 6, it says, Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, and the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So God told Moses to smite the rock. And this picture is Jesus Christ, who is the rock, being crucified on the cross and being hit with the rod of the law. And 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 4 it says and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was christ and now in numbers chapter 20 moses does something stupid with the rock remember he in exodus 17 he god told him to smite the rock and he did and water came out now in numbers 20 verses 7 through 11 it says and the lord spake unto moses saying take the rod and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water. And thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock. So, uh, so thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts drink. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord, as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. And he said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels. Must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand with his rod. He smote the rock twice. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. So the rock is Christ, and the soldier pierced the Lord's side, and out come blood and water. And in Numbers chapter 20, it pictures you after salvation, where you will speak to the rock. And get your prayers answers. But the, but the Lord told Moses to speak to the rock. And the children of Israel would have gotten water. But see that Moses' temper led him to hit the rock. So he smote the rock again. So in Exodus 17, 6. The fact that he hit the rock pictures Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. And the water coming out pictures the Holy Ghost coming down to live in believers after he's glorified. But here in Numbers 20. Moses hits the rock again and ruins the type that the Lord wanted because Jesus only dies for sins once, not twice. But Moses smites the rock more than once. Here he was just supposed to speak to the rock. And Jesus was just Jesus only died for sins once, as it says in Hebrews seven twenty seven. Who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once, once when he offered up himself. But Moses hit the rock more than once and ruined the picture, a great picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus just offered himself one time, but Moses smites the rock twice. And then in Numbers 21, you have another great story. In Numbers 21, 6, And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpent from us. And Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent. And set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Now remember this verse in the New Testament in John three fourteen says that as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So. Jesus became the serpent on a pole for us. In 2 Corinthians 5.21 it says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So Jesus Christ became that serpent. He became sin for us. And that's how we get healed of our sin. As we come to the Lord Jesus Christ and believe on him as our crucified, buried, and risen Savior. 
the people back there in the book of Numbers, they got bit by those serpents, and if they looked at that pole with that serpent on it, then they would get healed. You see the type and picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the symbol for medicine today, the symbol for medicine and healing, is a serpent wrapped around a pole. If you look on like ambulances and things like that, you'll see that serpent wrapped around a pole, just like here in the book of Numbers. And once again, the world can't get around the Bible. Then in Numbers 22 through 24, you have the story of Balak, who wants to stop God's people. Just like today, you have men who want to stop God's people. So Balak, the king of Moab, gets his men to approach this man named Balaam about cursing God's people, which is Israel. But Balaam knows better, and he says in Numbers twenty two eighteen, And Balaam answered and said unto the servants of Balak, If Balak will give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. And then you have something happen that you have only seen in the movies. In Numbers twenty two twenty one and 22, it says, And Balaam rose up in the morning and saddled his ass and went with the princes of Moab, and God's anger was kindled because he went. And the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. Now he was riding upon an ass, and his two servants were with him. And the ass saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand. And the ass turned aside out of the way and went into the field, and Balaam smote the ass to turn her into the way. But the angel of the Lord stood in the path of the vineyard, of the vineyards, a wall being on this side and a wall on that side. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself into the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall, and he smote her again. And the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam. And Balaam's anger was kindled, and he smote the ass with a staff. And the Lord opened the mouth of the ass. And she said unto Balaam, What have I done unto thee that thou hast smitten me these three times? And Balaam said unto the ass, Because thou hast mocked me, I would there with her. I would there were a sword in mine hand, for now would I kill thee. And the ass said unto Balaam, Am not I thine ass upon which thou hast ridden ever since I was thine unto this day? Was I ever wont to do so unto thee? And he said, Nay. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand. And he bowed down his head, and he fell, and fell flat on his face. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Wherefore hast thou smitten thine ass these three times? Behold, I went over to withstand thee, because thy way is perverse before me. And the ass saw me, and turned from me these three times. Unless she had turned from me, surely now also I had slain thee, and saved her alive. So here you see something that you only see in the movies. You saw Balaam's ass speak to him, and then you saw something even more crazy as Balaam talked right back to it. And, you know, you see all the movies with talking animals. That's That came from the Bible. You think, well, that was probably an original plot one day. But no, they had to have got it from the Bible. So Balaam... He seems like he's a good guy at first, yet he wants the money of this world from Balak. So he teaches Balak that if he can get Israel to intermarry with the heathen, then God will eventually destroy them himself. And later on, you can see where, where Israel kills Balaam for this reason. In Numbers 31 and verse 8, it talks about how they kill Balaam. Uh, they, it says they slew him with the sword. And it also calls Balaam a soothsayer. In Numbers 31, 16, it says, Behold, these caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor, and there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. So the counsel of Balaam, the counsel he gave Balak, caused the children of Israel to stumble, caused them to commit trespass against the Lord, and you also read about Balaam again in the New Testament in Revelation 2.14. It says, But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, 
who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So Balaam is a bad guy. He was a false prophet. He spake like he was for God's people, but he was only for himself. And such is the case of many false preachers today. But before this, Numbers 25, you have a man who was the opposite of Balaam. Uh, Balaam caused a stumbling block for Israel by causing them to intermarry with Moab and commit idolatry. But this man Phineas in Numbers 25 stopped the plague. So Numbers 25, 6 through 8 says, And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses, and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel, who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, saw it, he rose up from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand. And he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through the man of Israel and the woman through her belly, so the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. And those that died in the plague were twenty and four thousand. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, hath turned away my wrath, hath turned my wrath away from the children of Israel, while he was zealous for my sake among them, that I consume not the children of Israel in my jealousy. So notice that because of Phinehas, the high priest, the wrath of God was turned away from Israel. And this pictures Jesus Christ, because Jesus, our high priest, turned the wrath of God away from us when we believed on him for salvation. And that's why you read verses like Romans 5, 9, which says, Much more than being now justified by his blood, we are safe from wrath through him. So now in Numbers 31, after they had this great victory over the Midianites, they got all their spoil and everything else. They became satisfied. In Numbers 31, 9 through 11, it says, And the children of Israel took off, took all the women of Midian captives and their little ones and took the spoil of all their cattle and all their flocks and all their goods and they burnt all their cities wherein they dwelt and all their goodly castles with fire. And they took all the spoil and all the prey, both of men and of beasts. Now in Numbers 32, 5 through 7, it says, Wherefore said they, if we have found grace in thy sight, let this land be given unto thy servants for possession, and bring us not over Jordan. And Moses said unto the children of God and to the children of Reuben, Shall your brethren go to war, and shall ye sit here? And wherefore discourage ye the heart of the children of Israel from going over into the land which the Lord hath given them? And the Lord's anger was kindled against Israel. In Numbers 32, 13, it says, And the Lord's anger was kindled against Israel, and he made them wander in the wilderness forty years, until all the generation that had done evil in the sight of the Lord was consumed. So now they are going to have to wander forty years. This should remind you not to get complacent. Don't get spoiled. Don't get satisfied like they did here. See, they got all that spoil. They got all these things from the people of Midian. And they got satisfied. Don't ever get satisfied. Always stay on fire for God. Always stay wanting to do more. Wanting to learn more. Don't get satisfied with your knowledge of the Bible. Always be trying to learn more Bible. Always be trying to pray more. Always be trying to get more people saved. Because when it comes right down to it, you're not just going to be judged on how much you know or how many people you got saved, but you're going to be judged on the quality of your work for your entire Christian life. Say you just say you just do good for the first five years of your Christian life, and then the last 20 years of it, you don't do anything. You know, you don't want to get complacent. You don't want to get too satisfied because you'll just be wandering around in your Christian life, just like they have to wander around in the wilderness. And then in Numbers 33 through 36, uh, the people don't go over the land until Joshua steps on the scene. And Joshua pictures a type of the Lord Jesus Christ 
who gets us into the land. Whereas Moses pictures the law who doesn't get us into the land. But this has been an overview of the book of Deuteron or the book of Numbers, and next we will do the book of Deuteronomy.